Let me guess. You think that winning an NBA championship is hard. <laughs> oh, yeah, I get it. I would too if I wasn't so much smarter than you. The truth is, winning a championship in the NBA is fairly easy. Eh, the formula is, I should say. It's simple. And it wasn't until later reflection that I found that my formula is unfortunately similar to that of a certain Boston sports fans. Oh well, great minds think alike. Here's the formula. Have one of the five best players in the league, give them at least one all-NBA caliber sidekick, throw in a decent coach and some quality role players, and then just get lucky. That's it, really. Aside from the luck, the hardest part of that formula is getting one of those top shelf superstars. There's only so many players that can be him. Here's the list of guys since the three-point line who were the best player on the team that won the championship. Kareem, Bird, Moses, Magic, Isaiah, Jordan, Hakeem, Duncan, Shaq, Wade, KG, Kobe, Dirk, LeBron, Steph, Kawhi, Durant, Giannis, and Jokic. That list makes a ton of sense for the things they did before and or after they became champions. All of those guys established themselves as guys who deserved to be on that list. Maybe the ring solidified what we already thought. Maybe it was the thing that they were missing, but it's a list that just feels right. Of course, I've excluded the 04 Pistons from that list. Their best player, either Ben Wallace, my pick, or Chauncey Billups, a totally acceptable pick, does not make sense on that list. The 2004 Detroit Pistons are the anomaly. They are the team that won it all that does not belong. They did not follow the formula. They do not make sense. Their victory in the finals against the Los Angeles Lakers was and remains the greatest upset in NBA Finals history. Let's talk about the Lakers first, because really they're the ones that set this whole thing up. Every David needs a Goliath, the Tyson to their Douglas, the USSR to their red, white, and blue. The 04 Lakers were world beaters. If you're watching this video, I should barely have to tell you about their roster and accomplishments. Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Derek Fisher, Gary Payton, Carl Malone, Phil Jackson. The Lakers had three-peated as champions with the core of Kobe, Shaq, and Fisher. Three consecutive championships a feat that has not been accomplished since. Their run was ended by the Spurs in 03, but LA had retooled and were back on track to continue a dynasty that had every possibility of continuing for several more years. They had added supernova star power with Karl Malone and Gary Payton, both first ballot Hall of Famers who had been denied titles in their primes thanks to Jordan's Bulls. The two were both past those primes, but were still more than capable contributors. And with that championship core still intact, under the tutelage of no one other than the Zen Master, the 04 Lakers were really the first super team as we know it. They walked their way to 56 wins. Okay, walked might be an exaggeration. They dealt with some injuries and Kobe was flying back and forth from court appearances in Colorado. But the point remains, they were just too damn loaded. They rolled through the playoffs, shaking off Yao's Rockets, the defending champ Spurs, and MVP Kevin Garnett's Timberwolves on their way to their fourth finals in five years. And their opponent was the Pistons? These Pistons? It wasn't going to be a contest. In the Lakers' last nine finals games, they had lost once. Nobody picked the Pistons. Everyone just thought that it was neat that they had made it ready to give them the aw shucks, good job, good effort treatment. The first game of the series was played on June 6th, 2004 at the Staples Center in Los Angeles, California. There, the seams of history began to burst. But who are these Pistons? Why were they so heavily discounted? And what makes them so doggone weird? Essentially, the Pistons were nobodies. They were a ragtag group of misfits that teams had either overlooked or given up on. Chauncey Billups was a guy who'd been traded 50 games into his rookie year by Celtics fan favorite coach Rick Pitino. He'd bounced around the league and had basically become a bust. When he signed with Detroit in 03, it was his sixth team in seven years. 
The Pistons drafted Tayshon Prince with the 23rd pick in the 02 draft. That class turned out to be one of the weakest in recent memory. So, you know, saying he was a long shot was like saying I don't have my life figured out. They got Rip Hamilton from Washington in a trade because Michael Jordan, ever the competitor, who really put the killer in team killer during those years with the Wizards, wasn't really interested in developing young talent. Rip was only on the team because the Wizards didn't see a future with him. Rasheed Wallace was a mid-season acquisition, noted for being the face of the Jailblazers during his time with Portland, setting an unbreakable record with 40 technical fouls in a single season, and for once getting suspended for threatening a referee on a loading dock. And Ben Wallace wasn't even drafted. His journey to Detroit went through Juco, D2 basketball, a tryout in the Italian League, the Wizards, and the Magic. He'd been with Detroit since 01 as a throw-in for the Grant Hill trade and had carved out a starting role, but the defensive-minded center ended his career without ever averaging over 10 points a game for a season. That was the Pistons. A journeyman bust, a late-round long shot, a reject, a head case, and an undrafted specialist. The only man in the locker room with a championship pedigree was the man holding the clipboard, head coach Larry Brown. Brown had led the Kansas Jayhawks to a title in 1988, but Detroit was Brown's seventh stop in 21 years as a head coach in the pro ranks. He'd worn out his welcome at every stop of his career. Not to mention the impossible odds he faced in his pursuit of an NBA ring. That no coach had ever won a championship in both college and the NBA. When you look at it like that, yeah, it's no surprise that nobody picked the Pistons. On paper, they were one of the most underwhelming finals teams ever. On paper, Detroit was going to get smoked, like a cigarette around my drunk mom. And yet, in game one of the finals, those pesky Pistons wouldn't go away. Sure, Kobe and Shaq were getting theirs, but the Pistons were hanging with them. And you wouldn't believe it, but in the fourth quarter, they started to pull away. In a shocking upset. The Pistons beat the Lakers 87-75 on the road. It was a defensive game, to be certain. But the Pistons had put on a clinic of exquisite passing, great spacing, and off-ball movement. It wasn't a singular force taking on an unkillable behemoth. Instead, the Pistons stunned the Lakers and the world with solid defense and unselfish play. No bells, no whistles. For the first time in years, the Lakers had been soundly defeated in a finals game. In the second game, the Pistons again acted under the delusion that they belonged. They traded punches with Los Angeles for four quarters, fighting kilos above their weight. They would have won the game in regulation had Kobe not hit a game-tying three with two seconds left, giving the Lakers the chance to steal the game in overtime. With the series tied at a game apiece, the teams traveled to Detroit where the next three consecutive games would be played. There would be no game back in Los Angeles. The Lakers didn't know it yet, but they had already lost. Because in spite of everything I've said, and in spite of the sheer abnormality of their composition, the 4 Pistons played in a special way. A way that few teams, even champions in sports, have ever played. Distilled into a single sentence, they played the right way. If you know about these Pistons and you know about Larry Brown, you knew that was coming. As Howard Beck once said, there is no more recognizable idiom in his lexicon. It's a phrase that is universally preached by coaches everywhere, at every level of every sport, but one that is irrevocably linked to Larry Brown. Playing the right way. It was an idea that he'd carried with him at every stop of his journey each to some measure of success. From the Nuggets in the 76 ABA Finals, to Danny and the Miracles with KU, to the Spurs, Clippers, Pacers, and Sixers. We don't have to talk about the Olympic team. Or SMU. Or the Knicks. Ugh. Brown is coaching royalty not just because of his championship rings, but because of his adherence to that philosophy. He was named one of the 15 greatest coaches in NBA history, not just because of his win-loss record, but because he has influenced the culture of the game the right way. In as few words as possible, commit on the defensive end, 
keep the game simple, find the open man, make the right pass, sacrifice for each other, and win as a team. I know, not exactly revolutionary stuff, right? But Brown, as much as any coach, made it so with his unwavering commitment to that higher ideal. He occupies a special place, is himself a special branch on the coaching tree of basketball. He was a disciple of Dean Smith, who was taught by Fog Allen, who was taught by Dr. James Naismith. And I know what you're thinking. Clayton, shut up. You sound old. Fog Allen, in what AM radio, playing with a wheel and a stick in the yard world, does a grown man go by Fog? All this play the right way, sacrifice, come together as a team and make the right pass stuff is all Spurs stuff anyway. The stuff Pop has been preaching and winning titles with for decades. First, you must be new here. This is my dojo. We talk about the old stuff here. Second, it shouldn't surprise you then that Greg Popovich was taught by Larry Brown. The difference between the two is that Pop has always been very selective about the players the Spurs bring in. Not everyone can leave their egos at the door. But I think Brown was under the impression that everybody could do it. That once they saw what buying in would do for them, they'd never look back. I don't know if he realized how special it was that he'd found himself in this situation with a team of guys who could play the right way. But this Pistons team was special. They could and did play the right way. They were talented. Billups was Mr. Big Shot. Rip led the team in scoring. Prince was a phenomenal glue guy and a defender who owns maybe the second most famous block ever. Sheed was probably the best all-around player on the team when they got him. And Ben Wallace might have had the best defensive season a player has ever had. Not to mention great bench players that bought in and did their jobs to a T. They were a team. They bonded over the fact that they were rejects. It was their strength. They liked each other. They were constantly out to dinner together. Hamilton wanted his son to grow up and marry Chauncey's daughter. They all still stay in touch. And if you believe Rip, still talk to each other two or three times a week. The more I read of how they felt about each other, the more I was reminded of, ironically, the bad boys. Brothers in arms, united around a unifying idea. It's us against the world. And the more discounted we are, the more we believe in each other. Which could not have been any more antithetical to the way the Lakers felt about each other. Kobe was the NBA's persona non grata, and he and Shaq hated each other. They'd been able to stick to the script and follow the formula before, but it was boiling over at this point. The team had sacrificed thoughtful depth and balance to bring in Malone and Peyton, who, even though they were statistically productive, tipped the balance of stability for them and primed the team for an all-time ego implosion. They were the, been there, done that, we have the notoriety, flip the switch and try hard when it counts, team of all teams. They'd lost the hunger. The cliches about the inverse natures of the two teams are endless. Star power versus underdogs, individuals versus a team, the shallow, glitzy glam of Los Angeles, the blue collar going to work Detroit, a group that rose to the occasion, who found the most important, impactful allies to be each other, and the one that caved at the first sign of adversity, whose most lethal enemy was themselves. And on the court, it just happened. The Pistons transcended, and as one cohesive entity, subjugated the Lakers. Their scoring was ludicrously balanced, and almost every player on their roster contributed in some meaningful way. Big Ben was fantastic against O'Neal, and Tayshawn harassed Kobe into a historic shooting slump. Rip led the team in series scoring. Rashid had stretches of true dominance, and Billups set everybody up. Taking home the finals MVP, as Detroit won the next three games on their home court and captured their first championship since 1990. It is a championship victory that has no equal in its improbability. Just by the odds, the Pistons were 5-1 to one underdogs in the series. 
the longest finals odds for a champion in any data I could find. At the time, they had the second worst record of a champion since 1980. They are still the lowest scoring champion since the shot clock. They are the only championship team without a player that was named to the 75th anniversary team in the 40 plus years since the introduction of the three point line. Even more, not one player on their team was a first team all league selection at any point in their career. Not one not once. The only such champion in NBA history. But they beat the brakes off of a star-studded Lakers super team. They killed and buried a dynasty. Shaq was gone in days. Phil retired. Malone retired. Peyton left. Fisher left. Just like that, it was over for the Lakers. Meanwhile, the Pistons almost went back to back. They proved they weren't a fluke. They made the finals again the next season and took the Spurs to seven games. And then they made three more straight Eastern Finals appearances. They contended for another four years after this title. Yes, they won with defense. Not exactly as exciting as Showtime or the beautiful game. And yeah, that era might have favored defensive teams more than other eras would have. But I love that they were a defensive team. There's just something, I don't know, romantic about it. Defense is still one of the aspects of basketball that we don't really have easy to follow figures for. It exists as an absence of something. And it's also really, really damn hard to do. It takes the whole team playing just right for an entire possession to get a good stop. And to do that for a whole game, a whole series, it takes communication, high IQ, and a shitload of effort. To that end, the Pistons held their opponents to the fewest points of any champion in the shot clock era and tout the best defensive rating by a champion since the three-point line. When I said that Ben Wallace might have had the best defensive season ever, I meant it. His 4 season, ironically the one season in a five-year stretch where he didn't take home Defensive Player of the Year, has no equal when it comes to the advanced metrics. The most defensive win shares in a regular season since the merger. The best defensive rating for a regular season ever. The most defensive win shares in a postseason ever. And the best defensive rating for a postseason ever. He was the captain of the team, the hub of their wheel, and the catalyst for so much of their intensity. I don't want to say that he led them to the title. That convention goes against everything they stood for. Again, they did not follow the formula. On the list of Hall of Fame title-winning captains, Ben Wallace exists in a place all by himself. Then again, he was never alone. The 04 Pistons are anomalies. You cannot reconstruct them. You can't just find players like them that have the same stats. They were coached by a generational leader and bought into the innate power of team. Their competitive advantage was each other and their belief in the things they could do together. This Pistons team was and is the example of a basketball team that succeeds because of their cohesiveness. The 2004 Detroit Pistons won the championship with the greatest upset in the history of the NBA Finals. And they won it because they played the right way.